Figure 7-52. Alternate pressure application. Shrink tape. Another method of pressure application for oven cures is the use of shrink wrapping or shrink tape. This method is commonly used with parts that have been filament wound because some of the same rules for application apply. The tape is wrapped around the completed layup, usually with only a layer of release material between the tape and the layup. Heat is applied to the tape, usually using a heat gun to make the tape shrink, a process that can apply a tremendous amount of pressure to the layup. After shrinking, the part is placed in the oven for cure. High quality parts can be made inexpensively using shrink tape. See clamps. Parts can also be pressed together with clamps. This technique is used for solid laminate edges of honeycomb panels. Clamps, e.g., C-clamps and spring clamps, are used for pressing together the edges of components and or repair details. Always use clamps with pressure distribution pads, because damage to the part may occur if the clamping force is too high. Spring clamps can be used in applications where resin squeeze out during cure would require C-clamps to be retightened periodically. Shot bags and weights. Shot bags and weights can be used also to provide pressure, but their use is limited due to the low level of pressure imposed. Figure 7-52. Envelope bagging of repair. Curing of composite materials. A cure cycle is the time slash temperature slash pressure cycle used to cure a thermosetting resin system or prepreg. The curing of a repair is as important as the curing of the original part material. Unlike metal repairs in which the materials are pre-manufactured, composite repairs require the technician to manufacture the material. This includes all storage, processing, and quality control functions. An aircraft repair's cure cycle starts with material storage. Materials that are stored incorrectly can begin to cure before they are used for a repair. All time and temperature requirements must be met and documented. Consult the aircraft structural repair manual to determine the correct cure cycle for the part that needs to be repaired. Room temperature curing. Room temperature curing is the most advantageous in terms of energy savings and portability. Room temperature cure wet layup repairs do not restore either the strength or the durability of the original 250 degrees F or 350 degrees F cure components and are often used for wet layup fiberglass repairs for non-critical components. Room temperature cure repairs can be accelerated by the application of heat. Maximum properties are achieved at 150 degrees F. A vacuum bag can be used to consolidate supplies and to provide a path for air and volatiles to escape. Elevated temperature curing. All prepreg materials are cured with an elevated temperature cure cycle. Some wet layup repairs use an elevated cure cycle as well to increase repair strength and to speed up the curing process. The curing oven and heat ponder uses a vacuum bag to consolidate supplies and to provide a path for air and volatiles to escape. The autoclave uses vacuum and positive pressure to consolidate supplies and to provide a path for air and volatiles to escape. Most heating devices use a programmable computer control to run the cure cycles. The operator can select from a menu of available cure cycles or write his or her own program. Thermocouples are placed near the repair and they provide temperature feedback for the heating device. Typical curing temperature for composite materials is 250 degrees F or 350 degrees F. The temperature of large parts that are cured in an oven or autoclave might be different from that of an oven or autoclave during the cure cycle because they act like a heat sink. The part temperature is most important for a correct cure, so thermocouples are placed on the part to monitor and control part temperature. The oven or autoclave air temperature probe that measures oven or autoclave temperature is not always a reliable device to determine part curing temperature. The oven temperature and the part temperature can be substantially different if the part or tool acts as a heat sink. 7-32. The elevated cure cycle consists of at least three segments. Ramp up. The heating device ramps up at a set temperature typically between 3 degrees F to 5 degrees F per minute. Hold or soak. The heating device maintains the temperature for a predetermined period. Cool down. The heating device cools down at a set temperature. Cool down temperatures are typically below 5 degrees F per minute. When the heating device is below 125 degrees F, the part can be removed. When an autoclave is used for curing parts, make sure that the pressure in the autoclave is relieved before the door is opened. Figure 7-53. The curing process is accomplished by the application of heat and pressure to the laminate. The resin begins to soften and flow as the temperature is increased. At lower temperatures, very little reaction occurs. Any volatile contaminants, such as air and or water, are drawn out of the laminate with vacuum during this time. The laminate is compacted by applying pressure, usually vacuum, atmospheric pressure. Autoclaves apply additional pressure, typically 5100 psi. As the temperature approaches the final cure temperature, the rate of reaction greatly increases, and the resin begins to gel and harden. The hold at the final cure lets the resin finish curing and attain the desired structural properties. Composite Honeycomb Sandwich Repairs A large proportion of current aerospace composite components are light sandwich structures that are susceptible to damage and are easily damaged. Because sandwich structure is a bonded construction, and the face sheets are thin, damage to sandwich structure is usually repaired by bonding. Repairs to sandwich honeycomb structure use. 350. Temperature, degrees F. 
250. Decrease the temperature at a maximum rate of 5 degrees F, 3 degrees C, for each minute. Increase the temperature at a rate of 15 degrees F, 0.53 degrees C, for each minute. 150. 60. Pressure sig. 70. Time. 30. Pressure equals 40. 50 sig. 275 by 645 by gauge, for autoclave cure only. 0. Hold for 120, 180 minutes at 355 degrees F plus or minus 10 degrees F, 179 degrees C plus or minus 6 degrees C. The cure time starts when the last thermocouple is in the specified cure temperature range. Heat up rate starts at 130 degrees F, 54 degrees C. Apply heat to the repair after the autoclave is pressurized. Open the vacuum back to the atmosphere after the pressure in the autoclave is above 26, 138 bar gauge, 177, 121. Temperature, degrees C, 66. Below 125 degrees F, 52 degrees C. Release the pressure and remove the layup and vacuum bag materials from the pardon tool. No scale, 21. Note, for the oven cure, keep a minimum vacuum of 22 inches mercury, 22 Hg, during the full cure cycle. Figure 7-53, autoclave cure, 7-33. Similar techniques for the most common types of face sheet materials, such as fiberglass, carbon, and Kevlar registered. Kevlar registered is often repaired with fiberglass. Figure 7 54. Damage classification. A temporary repair meets the strength requirements, but is limited by time or flight cycles. At the end of the repair's life, the repair must be removed and replaced. An interim repair restores the required strength to the component. However, this repair does not restore the required durability to the component. Therefore, it has a different inspection interval and or method. A permanent repair is a repair that restores the required strength and durability to the component. The repair has the same inspection method and interval as the original component. External. Internal. Scarf. Patch adhesive composite skin core. Core splice adhesive repair core repair plug. Figure 7-54. Typical repairs for honeycomb sandwich structure. Sandwich structures. Minor core damage, filler and potting repairs. A potted repair can be used to repair damage to a sandwich honeycomb structure that is smaller than 0.5 inches. The honeycomb material could be left in place, or could be removed, and is filled up with a potting compound to restore some strength. Potted repairs do not restore the full strength of the part. Potting compounds are most often epoxy resins filled with hollow glass, phenolic or plastic micro balloons, cotton, flocks, or other materials. The potting compound can also be used as filler for cosmetic repairs to edges and skin panels. Potting compounds are also used in sandwich honeycomb panels as hard points for bolts and screws. The potting compound is heavier than the original core, and this could affect flight control balance. The weight of the repair must be calculated and compared with flight control weight and balance limits set out in the SRM. Damage requiring core replacement and repair to one or both faceplates. Note, the following steps are not a substitution for the aircraft-specific structural repair manual, SRM. Do not assume that the repair methods used by one manufacturer are applicable to another manufacturer. Step 1. Inspect the damage. Thin laminates can be visually inspected and tap tested to map out the damage. Figure 7-55 thicker laminates need more in-depth NDI methods, such as ultrasonic inspection. Check in the vicinity of the damage for entry of water, oil, fuel, dirt, or other foreign matter. Water can be detected with X-ray, backlight, or a moisture detector. Step 2. Remove water from damaged area. Water needs to be removed from the core before the part is repaired. Figure 7-56, if the water is not removed, it boils. R. E. B. I. L. E. Y. 2. 8. 0. 0. Point tap test instrument at tap test tap test with tap hammer. Figure 7-55. Tap testing techniques. 7-34. Pressure. 4 6. 2. 0 I 0. 8. Breather cloth heat blanket breather cloth thermocouple. Repair area. Figure 7-56. Vacuum bag method for drying parts. During the elevated temperature cure cycle, and the face sheets flow off the core, resulting in more damage. Water in the honeycomb core could also freeze at the low temperatures that exist at high altitudes, which could result in disbanding of the face sheets. Step 3. Remove the damage. Trim out the damage to the face sheet to a smooth shape with rounded corners, or a circular or oval shape. Do not damage the undamaged plies, core, or surrounding material. If the core is damaged as well, remove the core by trimming to the same outline as the skin. Figure 7-57. Step 4. Repair the damaged area. 
Use a flexible disc sander or a rotating pad sander to taper sand the uniform taper around the cleaned up damage. Some manufacturers give a taper ratio, such as 140, and others prescribe a taper distance like a 1 inch overlap for each existing ply of the face sheet. Remove the exterior finish, including inductive coating for an area that is at least 1 inch larger than the border of the taper. Remove all sanding dust with dry compressed air and a vacuum cleaner. Use a clean cloth moistened with approved solvent to clean the damaged area. Figure 7 58. Step 5. Installation of honeycomb core, wet layup. Use a knife to cut the replacement core. The core plug must be of the same type, class, and grade of the original core. The direction of the core cell should line up with the honeycomb. 0.50 inch minimum. Partial depth core replacement. Full depth core replacement. Figure 7 57. Core damage removal. 7 35. Replacement core plug. Adhesive asterisk asterisk. Adhesive film asterisk fabric pre -preg. Asterisk DMS 5 154, grade 5 or 2 plies of grade 3. Asterisk asterisk DMS 5 90, type 3, class 1, grade 50, or DMS 5 90, type IV. Section through repair area partial depth core replacement section AA. Figure 7 58. Paper sanding of repair area. Of the surrounding material. The plug must be trimmed to the right length and the solvent washed with an approved cleaner. For a wet layup repair, cut two plies of woven fabric that fit on the inside surface of the undamaged skin. Impregnate the fabric plies with a resin and place in the hole. Use potting compound around the core and place it in the hole. For a pre-preg repair, cut a piece of film adhesive that fits the hole and use a foaming adhesive around the plug. The plug should touch the sides of the hole. Line up the cells of the plug with the original material. Vacuum back the repair area and use an oven, autoclave, or heat blanket to cure the core replacement. The wet layup repair can be cured at a room temperature up to 150 degrees F. The pre-preg repair must be cured at 250 degrees F, or 350 degrees F. Usually, the core replacement is cured with a separate curing cycle, and not co-cured with the patch. The plug must be sanded flush with the surrounding area after the cure. Figure 7-59. Step 6. Prepare and install the repair plies. Consult the repair manual for the correct repair material, and the number of plies required for the repair. Typically, one more ply than the original number of plies is installed. Cut the plies to the correct size and ply orientation. The repair plies must be installed with the same orientation as that of the original plies being repaired. Impregnate the plies with resin for the wet layup repair, or remove the packing material from the pre-preg material. The plies are usually placed using the smallest ply first taper layup sequence. Figure 7-60. Step 7. Vacuum back the repair. Once the ply materials are in place, vacuum bagging is used to remove air and to pressurize the repair for curing. Refer to Figure 7-61 for packing instructions. Step 8. Curing the repair. The repair is cured at the required cure cycle. Wet layup repairs can be cured at room temperature. An elevated. Replacement core plug. Adhesive asterisk asterisk. Adhesive film asterisk. Asterisk BMS 5-154, grade 5. Asterisk asterisk BMS 5-90, type 3, class 1, grade 50, or BMS 5-90, type IV. Section through repair area full depth core replacement section BB. Figure 7-59. Core replacement. Temperature up to 150 degrees F can be used to speed up the cure. The pre-preg repair needs to be cured at an elevated cure cycle. Figure 7-62 parts that can be removed from the aircraft could be cured in a hot room, oven, or autoclave. A heating blanket is used for on-aircraft repairs. Remove the packing materials after curing and inspect the repair. The repair should be free from pits, blisters, resindrage and resin-starved areas. Lightly sand the repair patch to produce a smooth finish without damaging the fibers. Apply top finish and conductive coating, lighting protection. Step 9. Post-repair inspection. Use visual, tap, and or ultrasonic inspection to inspect the repair. Remove the repair patch if defects are found. Figure 7-63. Perform a balance check if a repair to a flight control surface was made, and ensure that the repaired flight control is within limits of the SRM. Failure to do so could result in flight control flutter, and safety of flight could be affected. 7-36. Core replacement asterisk. Orient repair plies in same direction as original layers. Foaming adhesive BMS 5-90, type 3, class 1, grade 50, or BMS 5-90, type IV. Extra ply pre-preg plies. 0.50 overlap, typical, adhesive film. BAAB. Non-structural sanding ply, adhesive film or fiberglass pre-preg. Determine number of plies, orientation, and material from skin identification. Aerated area. Do not damage fibers. Paper sanded area masking tape, remove after sanding. Asterisk cut splicing shown. Figure 7-60. Repair ply installation. Vacuum gauge. Vacuum bag material. Breather material. All plate. Leader material. Repair. Pressure. 4-6. 2. 
zero i zero eight vacuum probe vacuum back sealing compound heat blanket solid parting film perforated parting film figure seven dash sixty one vacuum processing solid laminates bonded flush patch repairs new generation aircraft have fuselage and wing structures made from solid laminates that are externally stiffened with co cured or co bonded stringers. These solid laminates have many more plies than the face sheets of honeycomb sandwich structures. The flush repair techniques for solid laminate structures are similar for fiberglass, Kevlar registered, and graphite with minor differences. A flush repair can be stepped, or, more commonly, starved, tapered. The scarf angles are usually small to ease the load into the joint, and to prevent the adhesive from escaping. This translates into thickness to length ratios of 110 to 170. Because inspection of bonded repairs is difficult, bonded repairs, as contrasted with bolted repairs, require a higher commitment to quality control, better trained personnel, and cleanliness. The scarf joint is more efficient from the viewpoint of load transfer as it reduces load eccentricity by closely aligning the neutral axis of the parent and the patch. However, this configuration has many drawbacks in making the repair. First, to maintain a small taper angle, a large quantity of sound material must be removed. Second, the replacement plies must be very accurately laid up and placed in the repair joint. Third, curing of replacement plies can result in significantly reduced strength if not cured in the autoclave. 7 37. 250. Soak. Increase the temperature 2 degrees F to 5 degrees F, 0.5 degrees C to 3 degrees C per minute. Hold for 90 to 150. Minutes at 260 degrees F plus 6 degrees F, 126 degrees C plus 6 degrees C. 121. Temperature, degrees F. 175. Ramp up, ramp down. 100. No scale. 70. Time. Decrease the temperature 5 degrees F per minute, 3 degrees C per minute, maximum. Below 125 degrees F, 52 degrees C. Release the pressure and remove the layup and vacuum bag materials. 80. Temperature, degrees C. 38. 21. Note. Keep a minimum vacuum of 22 inches of mercury during the cure cycle. Figure 7 62. Curing the repair. Heat affected area. Repair. Heat blanket area. Figure 7 63. Post repair inspection. Fourth, the adhesive can run to the bottom of the joint, creating a non uniform bond line. This can be alleviated by approximating the scarf with a series of small steps. For ease. Reasons, unless the part is lightly loaded, this type of repair is usually performed at a repair facility where the part can be inserted into the autoclave, which can result in part strength as strong as the original part. There are several different repair methods for solid laminates. The patch can be pre-cured, and then secondarily bonded to the parent material. This procedure most closely approximates the bolted repair. Figure 7-64 The patch can be made from pre-preg, and then co-cured at the same time as the adhesive. The patch can also be made using a wet layup repair. The curing cycle can also vary in length of time, cure temperature, and cure pressure, increasing the number of possible repair combinations. Scarf repairs of composite laminates are performed in the sequence of steps described below. Step 1. Inspection and mapping of damage. The size and depth of damage to be repaired must be accurately surveyed using appropriate non-destructive evaluation NDE, techniques. A variety of NDE techniques can be used to 7-38. Repair plies adhesive laminate. Sanding disc holder. Scarf outline periphery. Figure 7-64. A pre-cured patch can be secondarily bound to the parent material. Sanding disc. Finished scarf slope. Initially, machine scarf to a knife edge steeper than required. Scarf outline periphery. Inspect for damage in composite structures. The simplest technique is visual inspection, in which whitening due to delamination and or resin cracking can be used to indicate the damage area in semi-transparent composites, such as glass polyester and glass vinyl ester laminates. Visual inspection is not an accurate technique, because not all damage is detectable to the eye, particularly damage hidden by paint, damage located deep below the surface, and damage in non-transparent composites, such as carbon and aramid laminates. A popular technique is tap testing, in which a lightweight object, such as a coin or hammer, is used to locate damage. The main benefits of tap testing are that it is simple, and it can be used to rapidly inspect large areas. Tap testing can usually be used to detect delamination damage close to the surface, but becomes increasingly less reliable the deeper the delamination is located below the surface. Tap testing is not useful for detecting other types of damage, such as resin cracks and broken fibers. More advanced NDE techniques for inspecting composites are impedance testing, X-ray radiography, thermography, and ultrasonics. Of these techniques, ultrasonics is arguably the most accurate and practical, and is often used for surveying damage. Ultrasonics can be used to detect small delaminations located deep below the surface, unlike visual inspection and tap testing. Step 2. Removal of damaged material. Once the scope of the damaged area to be repaired has been determined, the damaged laminate must be removed. 
The edges of the sound laminate are then tapered back to a shallow angle. The taper slope ratio, also known as the scarf angle, should be less than 12 to 1, less than 5 degrees, to minimize the shear strains along the bond line after the repair patch is applied. The shallow angle also compensates for some errors in workmanship and other shock variables that might diminish patch adhesion. Figure 7 65. Finished scarf slope. Continue working scarf back to scarf outline dimension. Figure 7 65. Scarf patch of solid laminate. Step 3. Surface preparation. The laminate close to the scarf zone should be lightly abraded with sandpaper, followed by the removal of dust and contaminates. It is recommended that, if the scarf zone has been exposed to the environment for any considerable period of time, it should be cleaned with a solvent to remove contamination. Step 4. Molding. A rigid backing plate having the original profile of the composite structure is needed to ensure the repair has the same geometry as the surrounding structure. Step 5. Laminating. Laminated repairs are usually done using the smallest ply-first taper sequence. While this repair is acceptable, it produces relatively weak, resin-rich areas at each ply edge at the repair interface. The largest ply-first laminate sequence, where the first layer of reinforcing fabric completely covers the work area, produces a stronger interface joint. Follow the manufacturer's SRM instructions. Selection of the reinforcing material is critical to ensuring the repair has acceptable mechanical performance. The reinforcing fabric or tape should be identical to the reinforcement material used in the original composite. Also, the fiber orientation of the reinforcing layers within the repair laminate should match those of the original part laminate, so that the mechanical properties of the repair are as close to original as possible. 7-39 Step 6. Finishing. After the patch has cured, a conducting mesh and finished coat should be applied if needed. Trailing edge and transition area patch repairs. Trailing edges of control panels are highly vulnerable to damage. The aft 4 inches are especially subject to ground collision and handling, as well as the lightning strike. Repairs in this region can be difficult, because both the skins and the trailing edge reinforcement may be involved. The repairs to a honeycomb core on the damaged edge or panel are similar to the repair of a sandwich honeycomb structure discussed in the damage requiring core replacement and repair to one or both faceplate repair sections. Investigate the damage, remove damaged plies and core, dry the part, install new core, lay up the repair plies, curing and post inspection. A typical trail edge repair is shown in figure 7-66. Resin injection repairs. Resin injection repairs are used on lightly loaded structures for small damages to a solid laminate due to delamination. Two holes are drilled on the outside of the delamination area, and a low viscosity resin is injected in one hole until it flows out the other hole. Resin injection repairs are sometimes used on sandwich honeycomb structure to repair a face sheet dismant. Disadvantages of the resin injection method are that the fibers are cut as a result of drilling holes, it is difficult to remove moisture from the damaged area, and it is difficult to achieve complete infusion of resin. Figure 7-67. Non-structural sanding ply, adhesive film or fiberglass prepreg. Extra repair ply. Third repair ply, second repair ply, first repair ply, adhesive film. Paper sand. Masking tape, 3.0 to 4.0 wide. Figure 7-66. Trailing edge repair. Injection gun. 20 psi air. Drill holes. Skin. Inject resin delamination. Figure 7-67. Resin injection repair. Composite patch bonded to aluminum structure. Composite materials can be used to structurally repair, restore, or enhance aluminum, steel, and titanium components. Bonded composite doublers have the ability to slow or stop fatigue, crack growth, replace lost structural area due to corrosion grindouts, and structurally enhance areas with small and negative margins. Or on epoxy, glare registered, and graphite epoxy materials have been used as composite patches to restore damaged metallic wing skins, fuselage sections, floor beams, and bulkheads. As a crack growth inhibitor, the stiff bonded composite materials can strain the cracked area, reduce the growth stress in the metal, and provide an alternate load path around the crack. As a structural enhancement or blend-out filler, the high modulus fiber composites offer negligible aerodynamic resistance and tailorable properties. Surface preparation is very important to achieve the adhesive strength. Critlast silane and phosphoric acid anodizing are used to prepare aluminum skin. Film adhesives using a 250 degrees F, 121 degrees C, pure are used routinely to bond the doublers to the metallic structure. Critical areas of the installation process include a good thermal cure control, having and maintaining water-free bond surfaces, and chemically and physically prepared bond surfaces. Secondarily bonded pre-cured doublers and in-situ cured doublers have been used on a variety of structural geometries ranging from fuselage frames to door cutouts to blade stiffeners. Vacuum bags are used to apply the bonding and curing pressure between the doubler and metallic surface. Fiberglass molded mat repairs. Fiberglass molded mats consist of short fibers, and the strength is much less than other composite products that use continuous fibers. Fiberglass molded mats are not used for structural repair applications, but could be used for non. 7-40. Structural applications. 
The fiberglass molded mat is typically used in combination with fiberglass fabric. The molded mats are impregnated with resin just like a wet layup for fiberglass fabric. The advantage of the molded mat is the lower cost and the ease of use. Radome repairs. Aircraft radomes, being an electronic window for the radar, are often made of non-conducting honeycomb sandwich structure with only three or four plies of fiberglass. The skins are so thin, so that they do not block the radar signals. The thin structure, combined with the location in front of the aircraft, makes the radome vulnerable to hail damage, bird strikes, and lightning strikes. Low impact damage could lead to dismance and elimination. Often, water is found in the radome structure due to impact damage or erosion. The moisture collects in the core material and begins a freeze thaw cycle each time the airplane is flown. This eventually breaks down the honeycomb material causing a soft spot on the radome itself. Damage to a radome needs to be repaired quickly to avoid further damage and radar signal obstructions. Trap water or moisture can produce a shadow on the radar image and severely degrade the performance of the radar. To detect water ingression in radomes, the available NDE techniques include X-ray radiography, infrared thermography, and the radome moisture meter that measures the RF power loss caused by the presence of water. The repairs to radomes are similar to repairs to other honeycomb structures, but the technician needs to realize that repairs could affect the radar performance. A special tool is necessary to repair severely damaged radomes. Figure 7-68 Transmissivity testing after radome repair ensures that the radar signal is transmitted properly through the radome. Radomes have lightning protection strips mounted to the outside of the radome to dissipate the energy of a lightning strike. It is important that these lightning protection strips are in good condition to avoid damage to the radome structure. Typical failures of lightning protection strips that are found during inspection are high resistance caused by shorts in the strips or attaching hardware and dismanting of the strips from the radome surface. Figure 7-69 External bonded patch repairs. Repairs to damaged composite structures can be made with an external patch. The external patch repair could be made with pre-preg, a wet layup, or a pre-cured patch. External patches are usually stepped to reduce the stress concentration at the edge of the patch. The disadvantages of the external patch are the eccentricity of the loading that causes peel stresses and the protrusion of the patch in the airstream. The advantage of the external patch is that it is easier to accomplish than a flush scarf type repair. External bonded repair with pre-preg flies. The repair methods for carbon, fiberglass, and Kevlar registered are similar. Fiberglass is sometimes used to repair Kevlar registered material. The main steps in repairing damage with an external patch are investigating and mapping the damage, removal of the damage, layup of the repair plies, vacuum bagging, curing, and finish coating. Step 1. Investigating and mapping the damage. Use the tap tester ultrasonic test to map out the damage. Step 2. Damage removal. Trim out the damage to a smooth round or oval shape. Use scotch or sandpaper to rough up the parent surface at least one inch larger than the patch size. Clean the surface with an approved solvent and cheesecloth. Step 3. Layup of the repair plies. Use the SRM to determine the number, size, and orientation of the repair plies. The repair ply material and orientation must be the same as the orientation of the parent structure. The repair can be stepped to reduce peel stresses at the edges. Figure 7-68. Radome repair tool. Figure 7-69. Lightning protection strips on the radome. 7-41 Step 4. Vacuum bagging. A film adhesive is placed over the damaged area and the repair layup is placed on top of the repair. The vacuum bagging materials are placed on top of the repair, see pre-preg layup and control bleed out, and the vacuum is applied. Step 5. Curing the repair. The pre-preg patch can be cured with a heater blanket that is placed inside the vacuum bag, oven, or autoclave when the part can be removed from the aircraft. Most pre-pregs and film adhesives cure at either 250 degrees F or 350 degrees F. Consult the SRM for the correct cure cycle. Step 6. Applying top coat. Remove the vacuum bag from the repair after the cure and inspect the repair. Remove the patch if the repair is not satisfactory. Lightly sand the repair and apply a protective top coating. External repair using wet layup and double vacuum deviled method, DVD. Generally, the properties of a wet layup repair are not as good as a repair with pre-preg material, but by using a DVD method, the properties of the wet layup process can be improved. The DVD process is a technique to remove and trap air that causes porosity in wet layup laminates. The DVD process is often used to make patches for solid laminate structures for complex contoured surfaces. The wet layup patch is prepared in a DVD tool and then secondary bonded to the aircraft structure. Figure 7-70 The laminating process is similar to a standard wet layup process. The difference is how the patch is cured. Double vacuum double principle. The double vacuum bag process is used to fabricate wet layup or pre-preg repair laminates. Place the impregnated fabric within the Devil King assembly, shown in Figure 7-70. 2. Begin the Devil King process, evacuate the air within the inner flexible vacuum bag. Then, seal the rigid outer box onto the inner vacuum bag, and evacuate the volume of air between the rigid outer box and inner vacuum bag. 
Since the outer box is rigid, the second evacuation prevents atmospheric pressure from pressing down on the inner vacuum, back over the patch. This subsequently prevents air bubbles from being pinched off within the laminate, and facilitates air removal by the inner vacuum. Next, heat the laminate to a predetermined double king temperature, in order to reduce the resin viscosity, and further improve the removal of air and volatiles from the laminate. Apply the heat through a heat blanket that is controlled with thermocouples placed directly on the heat blanket. Once the double king cycle is complete, compact the laminate to consolidate the plies, by venting the vacuum source attached to the outer rigid box, allowing atmospheric pressure to re-enter the box, and provide positive pressure against the inner vacuum bag. Upon completion of the compaction cycle, remove the laminate from the assembly, and prepare for cure. DVD tools can be purchased commercially, but can also be fabricated locally from wood 2x4s and sheets of plywood, as illustrated in figure 7-70. Patch installation on the aircraft. After the patch comes out of the DVD tool, it is still possible to form it to the contour of the aircraft, but the time is typically limited to 10 minutes. Place a film adhesive, or paste adhesive, on the aircraft skin and place the patch on the aircraft. Use a vacuum bag and heater blanket to cure the adhesive. Figure 7-71 and 7-72. External repair using pre-cured laminate patches. Pre-cured patches are not very flexible, and cannot be used on highly curved or compound curved surfaces. The repair steps are similar, as an external bonded repair with pre prep plies, except step 3 and 4 that follow. Box top. Nails. Rigid outer box. Manufacture sides from 2x4. Top rigid box with two layers of breather and vacuum bag from one plywood. Drill 1 slash 4 air holes on each side. One thick plywood. Air holes, approximately 0.25 diameter. Inner vacuum bag extends past rigid box inner vacuum bag. Side boards, wooden 2x4. Figure 7-70. DVD tool made from wood 2x4s and plywood. 7-42. Vacuum port rigid outer box. 8V2. 7. 5. V1. 1. Insulation 2. Heat blanket 3. Hull plate 4. Non-porous film 5. Porous film 6. Patch laminate 7. Bagging materials 8. Bagging film V1. Inner vacuum V2. Outer vacuum. Bottom plate. Step 3. A pre-cured patch. Consult the SRM for correct size, ply thickness, and orientation. You can laminate and cure the pre-cured patch in the repair shop and secondary bond to the parent structure, or obtain standard pre-cured patches. Figure 7-73. 6. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. Vacuum port. Figure 7-71. Double vacuum double schematic. Figure 7-73. Pre-cured patches. Hold at 125 degrees F for 90 minutes plus or minus 5 minutes. 140, 120, 100, 80, 60, 40, 20. Ramp rate 1 degrees F to 5 degrees F per minute vent outer box after 60 minutes. Inner back full vacuum outer box full vacuum. Inner back full vacuum outer box no vacuum. 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. SMP 0029M1-9 double vacuum double cycle laminate thickness less than 16 plies. Hold at 125 degrees F for 150 minutes plus or minus 5 minutes. 140, 120, 180, 60, 40, 20. Ramp rate 1 degrees F to 5 degrees F per minute vent outer box after 60 minutes. Inner back full vacuum outer box full vacuum. Inner back full vacuum outer box no vacuum. 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160, 170, 180. SMP 0029M1-10 double vacuum double cycle laminate thickness 16 plies. Figure 7-72. DVD cure cycle. 7-43. Step 4. For a pre-cured patch. Apply film adhesive or paste adhesive to the damaged area and place the pre-cured patch on top. Vacuum back the repair and cure at the correct temperature for the film adhesive or paste adhesive. Most film adhesive cure at either 250 degrees F or 350 degrees F. Some paste adhesives cure at room temperature, although an elevated temperature could be used to speed the curing process. Bonded versus bolted repairs. Bonded repair concepts have found applicability in both types of manufacturing assembly methods. They have the advantage of not introducing stress concentrations by drilling fastener holes for patch installation and can be stronger than original part material. The disadvantage of bonded repairs is that most repair materials require special storage, handling, and curing procedures. Bolted repairs are quicker and easier to fabricate than bonded repairs. They are normally used on composite skins thicker than 0.125 inch to ensure sufficient fastener bearing area is available for load transfer. They are prohibited in honeycomb sandwich assemblies due to the potential for moisture intrusion from the fastener holes and the resulting core degradation. 
Bolted repairs are heavier than comparable bonded repairs, limiting their use on weight-sensitive flight control surfaces. Honeycomb sandwich parts often have thin face sheets, and are most effectively repaired by using a bonded scarf-type repair. A bonded external step patch can be used as an alternative. Bolted repairs are not effective for thin laminates because of the low-bearing stress of the composite laminate. Thicker solid laminates used on larger aircraft can be up to an inch thick in highly loaded areas, and these types of laminates cannot be effectively repaired using a bonded scarf-type repair. Figure 7-74. Bolted repairs. Aircraft designed in the 1970s used composite sandwich honeycomb structure for lightly loaded secondary structure, but new large aircraft use thick solid laminates for primary structure instead of sandwich honeycomb. These thick solid laminate structures are quite different from the traditional sandwich honeycomb structures used for flight controls, landing gear doors, flaps, and spoilers of today's aircraft. They present a challenge to repair, and are difficult to repair with a bonded repair method. Bolted repair methods have been developed to repair thicker solid laminates. Bolted repairs are not desirable for honeycomb sandwich structure due to the limited bearing strength of the thin face sheets, and weakened honeycomb structure from drilling. Bonded versus bolted repair bolted bonded. Lightly loaded structures laminate thickness less than 0.1. Highly loaded structures laminate thickness between 0.125 0.5. Highly loaded structures laminate thickness larger than 0.5. High peeling stresses. X, 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 X. Table 2. X. Honeycomb structure. X. Dry surfaces. X, X. Wet and or contaminated surfaces. X. Disassembly required. X. Restore unnotched strength. X. Figure 7 74. Bolted for suspended repair. Holes. The advantage of a bolted repair is that you need to select only patch material and fasteners, and the repair method is similar to a sheet metal repair. There is no need for curing the repair and storing the prepared repair material and film adhesives in the freezer. Patches may be made from aluminum, titanium, steel, or pre-cured composite material. Composite patches are often made from carbon fiber with an epoxy resin or fiberglass with an epoxy resin. You can repair a carbon fiber structure with an aluminum patch, but you must place a layer of fiberglass cloth between the carbon part and the aluminum patch to prevent galvanic corrosion. Titanium and pre-cured composite patches are preferred for repair of highly loaded components. Pre-cured carbon slash epoxy patches have the same strength and stiffness as the parent material as they are usually cured similarly. Titanium or stainless steel fasteners are used for bolted repairs of a carbon fiber structure. Aluminum fasteners corrode if used with carbon fiber. Rivets cannot be used because the installation of rivets using a rivet gun introduce damage to the hole and surrounding structure and rivets expand during installation, which is undesirable for composite structures because it could cause elimination of the composite material. Repair procedure step 1. Inspection of the damage. The tap test is not effective to detect elimination and thick laminates unless the damage is close to the surface. And 7-44. Ultrasonic inspection is necessary to determine the damage area. Consult the SRM to find an applicable NDI procedure. Step 2. Removal of the damage. The damaged area needs to be trimmed to a round or rectangular hole with large smooth radii to prevent stress concentrations. Remove the damage with a sander, router, or similar tool. Step 3. Patch preparation. Determine the size of the patch based on repair information found in the SRM. Cut, form, and shape the patch before attaching the patch to the damaged structure. It is easier to make the patch a little bigger than calculated and trim to size after drilling all fastener holes. In some cases, the repair patches are stock pre-shaped and pre-drilled. If cutting is to be performed, standard shop procedures should be used that are suitable for the patch material. Titanium is hard to work and requires a large powerful slip roller to curve the material. Metal patches require filing to prevent crack initiation around the cut edges. When drilling pilot holes in the composite, the holes for repair fasteners must be a minimum of 4 diameters from existing fasteners, and have a minimum edge distance of 3 fastener diameters. This is different from the standard practice for aluminum of allowing a 2 diameter distance. Specific pilot hole sizes and drill types to be used should follow specific SRM instructions. Figure 7-75. Step 4. Hole Pattern Layout. To locate the patch on the damaged area, draw two perpendicular center lines on the parent structure and on the patch material that define the principal loader geometric directions. Then, lay out hole pattern on the patch and drill pilot holes in the patch material. Align the two perpendicular center lines of the patch with the lines on the parent structure and transfer the pilot holes to the parent material. Use clicos to keep the patch in place. Mark the edges of the patch so that it can be returned to the same location easily. Step 5. Drilling and re-aiming holes in patch and parent structure. Composite skins should be backed up to prevent splitting. Enlarge the pilot holes in the patch and parent materials with a drill 164 under size and then ream all holes to the correct size. A tolerance of plus 0.0025 slash 0.000 inch is usually recommended for aircraft parts. For composites, this means interference fasteners are not used. 
Step 6. Fastener installation. Once fastener holes are drilled full size and re-aimed, permanent fasteners are installed. Before installation, measure the fastener grip length for each fastener using a grip length gauge. As different fasteners are required for different repairs, consult the SRM for permissible fastener type and installation procedure. However, install all fasteners wet with sealant and with proper torque for screws and bolts. Step 7. Sealing of fasteners and patch. Sealants are applied to bolted repairs for prevention of water slash moisture intrusion, chemical damage, galvanic corrosion, and fuel leaks. They also provide contour smoothness. The sealant must be applied to a clean surface. Masking tape is usually placed around the periphery of the patch, parallel with the patch edges and leaving a small gap between the edge of the patch and the masking tape. Sealing compound is applied into this gap. Edge distance is three times the diameter of the fastener. High locker lock bolt. Three rows of fasteners are required. Radius of repair plate corner is 0.5. Spacing four to six times the diameter of the fastener. Damage is cut out to a smooth rectangular shape. Figure 7-75. Repair layout for bolted repair of composite structure. 7-45. Step 8. Application of finished coat and lightning protection mesh. The repair needs to be sanded, primed, and painted with an approved paint system. A lightning protection mesh needs to be applied if composite patches are used in an area that is prone to lightning strikes. Fasteners used with composite laminates. Many companies make specialty fasteners for composite structures, and several types of fasteners are commonly used. Threaded fasteners, lock bolts, blind bolts, blind rivets, and specialty fasteners for soft structures, such as honeycomb panels. The main differences between fasteners for metal and composite structures are the materials and the footprint diameter of nuts and collars. Corrosion precautions. Neither fiberglass nor Kevlar registered fiber reinforced composites cause corrosion problems when used with most fastener materials. Composites reinforced with carbon fibers, however, are quite cathodic when used with materials, such as aluminum or cadmium, the latter of which is a common plating used on fasteners for corrosion protection. Fastener materials. Titanium alloy T6L4V is the most common alloy for fasteners used with carbon fiber reinforced composite structures. Austenitic stainless steels, super alloys, e.g., A286, multi-phase alloys, e.g., MP35 and or MP159, and nickel alloys, e.g., alloy 718, also appear to be very compatible with carbon fiber composites. Fastener system for sandwich honeycomb structures, SPS Technologies Comptite. The adjustable sustained preload, AS, fastening system provides a simplified method of fastening composite, soft core, metallic or other materials, which are sensitive to fastener clamp up or installation force conditions. Clamping force can be infinitely adjustable within maximum recommended torque limits, and no further load is applied during installation of the lock collar. The fastener is available in two types. The AST registered as full shank, and the 2AST registered as a pilot type shank. Figures 7-76 and 7-77. High lock registered and tucked spin registered lock bolt fasteners. Most composite primary structures for the aircraft industry are fastened with high locks registered, high shear corp, or hux spin registered lock bolts for permanent installations. The high lock registered is a threaded fastener that incorporates a hex key in the threaded end to react to the torque applied to the collar during installation. The collar includes a frangible portion that separates at a predetermined torque value. Figure 7-78. Figure 7-76. Ask fastener system. The lock bolt incorporates a collar that is swaged into annular grooves. It comes in two types, pull and stump. The pull type is the most common, where a frangible pintail is used to react the axial load during the swaging of the collar. When the swaging load reaches a predetermined limit, the pintail breaks away at the breakneck groove. The installation of the high lock registered and the pull type hux spin registered lock bolt can be performed by one technician from one side of the structure. The stump type lock bolt, on the other hand, requires support on the head side of the fastener to react the swage operation. This method is usually reserved for automated assembly of the tail structure in which access is not a problem. The specific differences in these fasteners for composite structure in contrast to metal structure are small. For the high lock registered, material compatibility is the only issue, aluminum collars are not recommended. Standard collars of A286, 303 stainless steel, and titanium alloy are normally used. The hux spin registered lock bolt requires a hat-shaped collar that incorporates a flange to spread the high bearing loads during installation. The lock bolt pin designed for use in composite structure has six annular grooves as opposed to five for metal structure. Figure 7-79 and 7-80. Eddy bolt registered fasteners. Eddy bolt registered fasteners, Alcoa, are similar in design to Hilox registered and are a natural choice for carbon fiber composite structures. The Eddy bolt registered pin is designed with flutes in the threaded portion, which allow a positive lock to be made during installation using a specially designed mating nut or collar. The mating nut has three lobes that serve as driving ribs. During installation, at a predetermined preload, the lobes. 7-46. 1. 
4. Pin component installed clearance fit. Lock collar placed on pin. 2. 5. Sleeve component threaded on pin. Lock collar swaged on pin splines. 3. 6. Port control tool tightened sleeve pin tail breaks off. Figure 7 77. Ask fastener system installation sequence. HLH 103, HLH 104, HLH 110, HLH 111, or HLH 500 installation tool. Figure 7 78. High lock register installation. Large 130 flush shear head. Lock proofs. CP titanium flanged collar pull proofs. Figure 7 79. Hux pin registered lock bolt. Compress the nut material into the flutes of the pin and form the locking feature. The advantage for composite structure is that titanium alloy nuts can be used for compatibility and weight saving without the fear of galling. The nuts spin on freely, and the locking feature is established at the end of the installation cycle. Figure 7 81. Cherry ZZ Buck registered, CSR 90433, hollow rivet. The Cherry Hollow NDZ Buck registered rivet is made from titanium slash columbium alloy and has a shear strength of 40 ksi. The EZ Buck registered rivet is designed to be used in a double flush application for fuel tanks. The main advantage of this type of rivet is that it takes less than half the force of a solid rivet of the same material. The rivets are installed with automated riveting equipment or a rivet squeezer. Special optional dies ensure that the squeezer is always centered during installation, avoiding damage to the structure. Figure 7-82. Lined fasteners. Composite structures do not require as many fasteners as metal aircraft, because stiffeners and doublers are co-cured with the skins, eliminating many fasteners. The size of panels on aircraft has increased in composite structures, which causes backside inaccessibility. Therefore, lined fasteners or screws and nut plates must be used in these areas. Many manufacturers make lined fasteners for composite structures. A few are discussed below. 7-47 1. 4. Pool engages lock bolt pintail. Pintail fractures at the brake notch. 2. 5. Cap closes, collar swage begins. Pool anvil reverses off swaged collar. 3. 6. Swage process complete installation complete. Figure 7 80. Hux spin registered installation sequence. Figure 7 81. Eddy bolts registered. Line bolts. The Cherry Maxibolt registered is available in titanium for compatibility with composite structures. The shear strength of the Maxibolt registered is 95 ksi. It can be installed from one side with a G83 or equivalent pneumatic hydraulic installation tool and is available in 100 degrees flush head, 130 degrees flush head, and protruding head styles. Figure 7 83. The Elko UAP trademark line bolt system is designed for composite structures and is available in titanium and stainless steel. The UAP trademark line bolt system is available in 100 degrees flush head, 130 degrees flush head, and protruding head styles. The Aku Lock trademark line fastening system is designed specifically for use in composite structures in which access is limited to one side of the structure. It combines high joint preload with a large diameter footprint on the blind side. The large footprint enables distribution of the joint preload over a larger area, virtually eliminating the possibility of delaminating the composite structure. The shear strength of the Aku Lock trademark is 95 ksi, and it is available in 100 degrees flush head, 130 degrees flush head, and protruding head styles. A similar fastener designed by Monogram is called the Radial Lock Registered. Figure 7 84 Fiberlite. The Fiberlite fastening system uses composite materials for a wide range of aerospace hardware. The strength of Fiberlite fasteners is equivalent to aluminum at two thirds the weight. The composite fastener provides good material compatibility with carbon fiber and fiberglass. Screws and nut plates in composite structures. The use of screws and nut plates in place of high locks registered or blind fasteners is recommended if a panel must be removed periodically for maintenance. Nut plates used in composite structures usually require three holes, two for attachment of the nut plate and one for the removable screw, although rivetless nut plates and adhesive bonded nut plates are available that do not require drilling and countersinking two extra holes. 7-48. Rivet diameter. 1-8, 4. 5 slash 32, 5, 3 slash 16, 6, 7 slash 32, 7, ref, 0 0.028, 0 0.037, 0 0.046, 0 0.046, CSR 90433, 100 degrees plus or minus 1 degrees, B ref, 0 0.028, 0 0.037, 0 0.046, 0 0.046, C1, DIA, 0 0.195, 0.189, 0 0.247, 0 0.242, 0 0.302, 0 0.297, 0 0.328, 0 0.323, C2, DIA, 0 0.195, 0 0.189, 0 0.247, 0 0.242, 0 0.302, 0 0.297, 0 0.328, 0 0.323, C DIA, 0 0.132, 0 0.129, 
0.1620.159 0.1950.191 0.227 0.224 A. Rep. For manufactured head B. Rep. For shop form head C. 2 C. 2 Rip range D. C. 1 100 degrees plus or minus 2 degrees Hollow NDZ but registered nominal diameter 1 slash 8, 4, 5 slash 32, 5, 3 slash 16, 6, 7 slash 32, 7. Upset load, LP, plus 200 LP. 2500, 2700, 3000, 3750. Squeezer yoke riveting machine. Cherry snap die, optional. 839B3 equals 3 slash 16 shank size. 839B13 equals 1 slash 4 shank size. Note, one die fits all fastener diameters. Head dimple. Hollow NDZ but registered composite material. Cherry flaring snap die. Cherry flaring snap die part numbers. Rivet diameter. 1 slash 8 5 slash 32 3 slash 16 7 slash 32. 3 slash 16 diameter mount. 839B1-4. 839B1-5. 839B1-6. 839B1-7. 1 slash 4 diameter mount. 839B10-4. 839B10-5. 839B10-6 839B10-7 Flushness plus 0.005 0.000 Flushness plus 0.015 0.000 Manufactured head Shop form head Figure 7-82 Cherry ZZ but hollow rivet Machining processes and equipment Drilling Hole drilling and composite materials is different from drilling holes in metal aircraft structures Different types of drill bits Higher speeds and lower feeds are required to drill precision holes. Structures made from carbon fiber and epoxy resin are very hard and abrasive, requiring special flat flute drills or similar four flute drills. Aramid fiber, Kevlar registered, slash epoxy composites are not as hard as carbon, but are difficult to drill unless special cutters are used, because the fibers tend to fray or shred unless they are cut clean while embedded in the epoxy. Special drill bits with closed pin points and fishtail points have been developed that slice the fibers prior to pulling them out of the drilled hole. If the Kevlar registered slash epoxy part is sandwiched between two metal parts, standard twist drills can be used. Equipment. Air-driven tools are used for drilling holes and composite materials. Drill motors with free speed of up to 20,000 RPM are used. A general rule for drilling composites is to use high speed and a low feed rate, pressure. Drilling equipment with a power feed control produces better hole quality than drill motors without power feed control. Drill guides are recommended, especially for thicker laminates. Do not use standard twist drill bits for drilling composite structures. Standard high-speed steel is unacceptable, because it dulls immediately, generates excessive heat, and causes plied elimination, fiber tear-out, and unacceptable hole quality. Drill bits used for carbon fiber and fiberglass are made from diamond-coated material or solid carbide because the fibers. 7-49 Z AL Head marking note DA equals diameter 0.005 crown Ref Basic part number A DA B A DA 4 0 8 7 7 7 E D DA E 1 6 3 Crip identification Manufacturer's identification R Rad Stem sleeve Not to exceed D diameter The press dot indicates titanium stem Shift washer Lock collar 130 degrees plus or minus 1 degrees Table 1 DIA Dash no 0 0.163 0 0.198 0 0.259 C Crip Installed strength LP 4 D plus 0 0.00165 05 06 06 A max 0 0.333 0 0.386 0 0.507 A min 0 0.296 0 0.342 0.463 B max 0 0.039 0 0.043 0 0.057 E max 0 0.215 0 0.250 0 0.305 R max 0 0.025 0 0.025 0 0.030 Z min 0 0.844 0 0.875 1.000 .00, Single shear minimum All limits 1980 2925 5005 0.164/0.167 0.199/0.202 0.260/0.263 pencil minimum 900 1400 2100 table 2 crypt-no 0.146 0.209 0.271 0.334 0.396 0.459 0.400 
0.5 Overlap min. Crib limits. 44. 1 slash 16 range min max. 02. 03. 04. 05. 06. 07. 08. 09. 10. 11. 12. Min max. 0 0.094. 0 0.154. 0 0.219. 0 0.281. 0 0.344. 0 0.406. 0 0.469. 0 0.531, 0 0.594, 0 0.656, 0 0.719, 0 0.157, 0 0.220, 0 0.282, 0 0.345, 0 0.407, 0 0.470, 0 0.532, 0 0.595, 0 0.657, 0 0.720, 0 0.782, overlap max, 0 0.173, 0 0.236, 0 0.298, 0 0.361, 0 0.423, 0 0.486, 0 0.548, 0 0.611, 0 0.673, 0 0.736, 0 0.798, 0 0.05. Diameter. LRFK max. 0 0.476, 0 0.536, 0 0.602, 0 0.664, 0 0.727, 0 0.789. 0 0.852, 0 0.914, 0 0.977, 1.039, 1.102, grip limits, overlap min, 1 slash 16 range, 0 0.336, 0 0.398, 0 0.460, 0 0.523, 0 0.585, 0 0.648, 0 0.710, 0 0.773, 0 0.835, 0 0.898, 0 0.960, 9, 0 0.203, 0 0.265, 0 0.328, 0 0.390, 0 0.453, 0 0.515, 0 0.578, 0 0.640, 0 0.703, 0 0.120, 0 0.156, 0 0.219, 0 0.281, 0 0.344, 0 0.406, 0 0.469, 0 0.531, 0 0.594, 0 0.656, 0 0.719, 0 0.157, 0 0.220, 0 0.282, 0 0.345, 0 0.407, 0 0.470, 0 0.532, 0 0.595, 0 0.657, 0 0.720, 0 0.782, overlap max, 0 0.173, 0 0.236, 0 0.298, 0 0.361, 0 0.423, 0 0.486, 0 0.548, 0 0.611, 0 0.673, 0 0.736, 0 0.798, 0 0.6 diameter, LRFK max, 0 0.355, 0 0.417, 0 0.480, 0 0.542, 0 0.605, 0 0.667, 0 0.730, 0 0.792, 0 0.855, 0 0.917, 0 0.980, 0 0.521, 0 0.584, 0 0.647, 0 0.709, 0 0.772, 0 0.834, 0 0.897, 0 0.959, 1 1.024, 0 0.1 0.8 diameter, LRFK max, 0 0.479, 0 0.541, 0 0.604, 0 0.666, 0 0.729, 0 0.791, 0 0.854, 0 0.916, 0 0.979, 1.041, 0 0.645, 0 0.708, 0 0.770, 0 0.833, 0 0.895, 0 0.958, 1.020, 1.083, 1.145, 1.208, 1 Figure 7 83, Jerry's Titanium Maxibold. Are so hard that standard high speed steel, HSS, drill bits do not last long. Typically, twist drills are used, but grad point drills are also available. The Kevlar registered fibers are not as hard as carbon, and standard HSS drill bits can be used. The hold quality can be poor if standard drill bits are used, and the preferred drill style is the sickle shaped plank drill. This drill first pulls on the fibers, and then shears them, which results in a better quality hole. 
Larger holes can be cut with diamond coated hole saws or fly cutters, but only use fly cutters in a drill press, and not in a drill motor. Figure 7-85, 7-86, and 7-87. Figure 7-84. Atu Lock Trademark Installation. 7-50. Figure 7-85. Link Type Drill for Drilling of Wear Registered. Figure 7-86. Drilling and Cutting Tools for Composite Materials. Figure 7-87. Auto Feed Drill. Processes and Precautions. Composite materials are drilled with drill motors operating between 2,000 and 20,000 RPM at a low feed rate. Drill motors with a hydraulic dash pod or other type of feed control are preferred because they restrict the surging of the drill as it exits the composite materials. This reduces breakout damage and eliminations. Parts made from tape products are especially susceptible to breakout damage. Parts made from fabric material have experienced less damage. The composite structure needs to be packed with a metal plate or sheet to avoid breakout. Holes in composite structures are often pre-drilled with a small pilot hole, enlarged with a diamond coated or carbide drill bit and re-aimed with a carbide reamer to final hole size. Back counter boring is a condition that can occur when carbon slash epoxy parts made metal substructure parts. The back edge of the hole in the carbon slash epoxy part can be eroded or radius by metal chips being pulled through the composite. The condition is more prevalent when there are gaps between the parts or when the metal debris is stringy rather than small chips. Back counter boring can be minimized or eliminated by changing feeds and speeds, other geometry, better part clamp of adding a final ream pass, using a pet drill, or combination of these. When drilling combinations of composite parts with metal parts, the metal parts may govern the drilling speed. For example, even though titanium is compatible with carbon slash epoxy material from a corrosion perspective, lower drilling speeds are required in order to ensure no metallurgical damage occurs to the titanium. Titanium is drilled with low speed and high feed. Drill bits suitable for titanium might not be suitable for carbon or fiberglass. Drill bits that are used for drilling titanium are often made from cobalt vanadium. Drill bits used for carbon fiber are made from carbide or are diamond coated to increase drill life and to produce an accurate hole. Small diameter high speed steel drill bits such as no. 40 drill, which are used to manually drill pilot holes, are typically used because carbide drills are relatively brittle and are easily broken. The relatively low cost of these small HSS drill bits offsets the limited life expectancy. High speed steel drill bits may last for only one hole. The most common problem with carbide cutters used in hand drill operations is handling damage, chipped edges, to the cutters. A sharp drill with a slow constant feed can produce a 0.1 mm, 0.004 inch tolerance hole through carbon slash epoxy plus thin aluminum, especially if a drill guide is used. With hard tooling, tighter tolerances can be maintained. When the structure under the carbon slash epoxy is titanium, drills can pull titanium chips through the carbon slash epoxy and enlarge the hole. In this case, a final ream operation may be required to hold tight hole tolerances. Carbide reamers are needed for holes through carbon slash epoxy composite structure. In addition, the exit end of the hole needs good support to prevent splintering and eliminations when the reamer removes more than about 0.13 mm, 0.005 inch, on the diameter. The support can be the substructure or a board held firmly against the back surface. Typical reaming speeds are about one half of the drilling speed. 7-51 Cutting fluids are not normally used or recommended for drilling thin, less than 6.3 mm, or 0.25 inch thick, carbon slash epoxy structure. It is good practice to use a vacuum while drilling in composite materials to avoid that carbon dust freely floats around the work area. Countersinking. Countersinking a composite structure is required when flush head fasteners are to be installed in the assembly. For metallic structures, a 100 degrees included angle shear tension head fastener has been the typical approach. Composite structures, two types of fastener are commonly used. A 100 degrees included angle tension head fastener or a 130 degrees included angle head fastener. The advantage of the 130 degrees head is that the fastener head can have about the same diameter as a tension head 100 degrees fastener with the head depth of a shear type head 100 degrees fastener. For seating flush fasteners in composite parts, it is recommended that the countersink cutters be designed to produce a controlled radius between the hole and the countersink to accommodate the head to shank fillet radius on the fasteners. In addition, a chamfer operation or a washer may be required to provide proper clearance for protruding head fastener head to shank ready. Whichever head style is used, a matching countersink slash chamfer must be prepared in the composite structure. Carbide cutters are used for producing a countersink and carbon slash epoxy structure. These countersink cutters usually have straight flutes similar to those used on metals. For Kevlar registered fiber slash epoxy composites, S-shaped positive rate cutting flutes are used. If straight fluted countersink cutters are used, a special thick tape can be applied to the surface to allow for a clean cutting of the Kevlar registered fibers, but this is not as effective as the S-shaped fluted cutters. Use of a piloted countersink cutter is recommended because it ensures better concentricity between the hole and the countersink and decreases the possibility of gaps under the fasteners due to misalignment or deliminations of the part. 
Use a micro stop countersink gauge to produce consistent countersink wells. Do not countersink through more than 70% of the skin depth, because a deeper countersink well reduces material strength. When a piloted countersink cutter is used, the pilot must be periodically checked for wear, as wear can cause reduction of concentricity between the hole and countersink. This is especially true for countersink cutters with only one cutting edge. For piloted countersink cutters, position the pilot in the hole, and bring the cutter to full RPM, before beginning to feed the cutter into the hole and preparing the countersink. If the cutter is in contact with the composite, before triggering the drill motor, you may get splintering. Cutting processes and precautions. Cutters that work well for metals would either have a short life, or produce a poorly cut edge, if used for composite materials. The cutters that are used for composites vary with the composite material that is being cut. The general rule for cutting composites is high speed and slow feed. Carbon fiber reinforced plastics. Carbon fiber is very hard, and quickly wears out high speed steel cutters. For most trimming and cutting tasks, diamond grit cutters are best. Aluminum oxide or silicon carbide sandpaper or cloth is used for sanding. Silicon carbide lasts longer than aluminum oxide. Router bits can also be made from solid carbide or diamond coated. Glass fiber reinforced plastics. Glass fibers, like carbon, are very hard, and quickly wear out high speed steel cutters. Fiberglass is drilled with the same type of material drill bits as carbon fiber. Aramid, Kevlar registered, fiber reinforced plastics. Aramid fiber is not as hard as carbon and glass fiber, and cutters made from high speed steel can be used. To prevent loose fibers at the edge of aramid composites, hold the part, and then cut with a shearing action. Aramid composites need to be supported with a plastic backup plate. The aramid and backup plate are cut through at the same time. Aramid fibers are best cut by being held in tension and then sheared. There are specially shaped cutters that pull on the fibers and then shear them. When using scissors to cut aramid fabric or pre-preg, they must have a shearing edge on one blade and a serrated or grooved surface on the other. These serrations hold the material from slipping. Sharp blades should always be used as they minimize fiber damage. Always clean the scissor serrations immediately after use, so the uncured resin does not ruin the scissors. Always use safety glasses and other protective equipment when using tools and equipment. Cutting equipment. The bandsaw is the equipment that is most often used in a repair shop for cutting composite materials. A toothless carbide or diamond coated saw blade is recommended. A typical saw blade with teeth does not last long if carbon fiber or fiberglass is cut. Figure 7-88 air-driven hand tools, such as routers, saber saws, die grinders, and cut-off wheels, can be used to trim composite parts. Carbide or diamond-coated cutting tools produce a better finish, and they last much longer. Specialized shops have ultrasonic, water jet, and laser cutters. These types of equipment are numerical controlled, NC, and produce superior edge and hold quality. 7-52. Figure 7-88. Bandsaw. A water jet cutter cannot be used for honeycomb structure, because it introduces water in the part. Do not cut anything else on equipment that is used for composites, because other materials can contaminate the composite material. Repreg materials can be cut with a CNC gerber table. The use of this equipment speeds up the cutting process and optimizes the use of the material. Design software is available that calculates how to cut plies for complex shapes. Figure 7-89. Repair safety. Advanced composite materials including prepreg, resin systems, cleaning solvents, and adhesives could be hazardous, and it is important that you use personal protection equipment. It is important to read and understand the safety data sheets, SDS, and handle all chemicals, resins, and fibers correctly. The SDS lists the hazardous chemicals in the material system, and it outlines the hazards. The material could be a respiratory irritant or carcinogenic, or another kind of dangerous substance. Figure 7-89. Gerber cutting table. Eye protection. Always protect eyes from chemicals and flying objects. Wear safety glasses at all times and, when mixing or pouring acids, wear a face shield. Never wear corrective contact lenses in a shop, even with safety glasses. Some of the chemical solvents can melt the lenses and damage eyes. Dust can also get under the lenses, causing damage. Respiratory protection. Do not breathe carbon fiber dust and always ensure that there is a good flow of air where the work is performed. Always use equipment to assist in breathing when working in a confined space. Use a vacuum near the source of the dust to remove the dust from the air. When sanding or applying paint, you need a dust mask or a respirator. A properly fitted dust mask provides the protection needed. For application of paints, a sealed respirator with the correct filters or a fresh air supply respirator is required. Downdraft tables. A downdraft table is an efficient and economical device for protecting workers from harmful dust caused by sanding and grinding operations. The tables are also useful housekeeping tools, because the majority of particulate material generated by machining operations is immediately collected for disposal. Downdraft tables should be sized and maintained to have an average face velocity between 100 and 150 cubic feet per minute. The downdraft table draws contaminants like dust and fibers away from the operator's material. 
Now draft tables should be monitored, and filters changed on a regular basis to provide maximum protection and particulate collection. Skin protection. During composite repair work, protect your skin from hazardous materials. Chemicals could remain on hands that burn sensitive skin. Always wear gloves and clothing that offer protection against toxic materials. Use only approved gloves that protect skin and do not contaminate the composite material. Always wash hands prior to using the toilet or eating. Damaged composite components should be handled with care. Single fibers can easily penetrate the skin, splinter off, and become lodged in the skin. Fire protection. Most solvents are flammable. Close all solvent containers and store in a fireproof cabinet when not in use. Make sure that solvents are kept away from areas where static electricity can occur. Static electricity can occur during sanding operations or when bagging material is unrolled. It is preferable to use air-driven tools. If electric tools are used, ensure that they are the enclosed type. Do not mix too much resin. Resin. 7-53. Put overheat and start smoking caused by the exothermic process. Ensure that a fire extinguisher is always nearby. Transparent plastics. Plastics cover a broad field of organic synthetic resin and may be divided into two main classifications. Thermoplastics and thermosetting plastics. A. Thermoplastics may be softened by heat and can be dissolved in various organic solvents. Acrylic plastic is commonly used as a transparent thermoplastic material for windows, canopies, tech. Acrylic plastics are known by the trade names of Lucite Registered or Plexiglas Registered, and by the British as Perspex Registered, and meet the military specifications of MIL-P5425 for regular acrylic, and MIL-P8184 for craze-resistant acrylic. B. Thermosetting plastics do not soften appreciably under heat, but may char and blister at temperatures of 240-260 degrees C, 400-500 degrees F. Most of the molded products of synthetic resin composition, such as phenolic, urea formaldehyde, and melamine formaldehyde resins, belong to the thermosetting group. Once the plastic becomes hard, additional heat does not change it back into a liquid as it would with a thermoplastic. Optical considerations. Scratches and other types of damage that obstruct the vision of the pilots are not acceptable. Some types of damage might be acceptable at the edges of the windshield. Identification. Storage and handling. Because transparent thermoplastic sheets soften and deform when they are heated, they must be stored where the temperature never becomes excessive. Store them in a cool, dry location away from heating coils, radiators, or steam pipes, and away from such fumes as are found in paint spray booths or paint storage areas. Keep paper mask transparent sheets out of the direct rays of the sun, because sunlight accelerates deterioration of the adhesive, causing it to bond to the plastic and making it difficult to remove. Store plastic sheets with the masking paper in place, and bins that are tilted at a 10 degrees angle from the vertical to prevent buckling. If the sheets are stored horizontally, take care to avoid getting dirt and chips between them. Stacks of sheets must never be over 18 inches high, with the smallest sheets stacked on top of the larger ones so there is no unsupported overhang. Leave the masking paper on the sheets as long as possible, and take care not to scratch or gouge the sheets by sliding them against each other or across rough or dirty tables. Store form sections with ample support so they do not lose their shape. Vertical nesting should be avoided. Protect formed parts from temperatures higher than 120 degrees F, 49 degrees C, and leave their protective coating in place until they are installed on the aircraft. Forming procedures and techniques. Transparent acrylic plastics get soft and pliable when they are heated to their forming temperatures and can be formed to almost any shape. When they cool, they retain the shape to which they were formed. Acrylic plastic may be cold bent into a single curvature if the material is thin and the bending radius is at least 180 times the thickness of the sheet. Cold bending beyond these limits impose so much stress on the surface of the plastic that tiny fissures or cracks, all crazing, form. Heating. Wear cotton gloves when handling the plastic to eliminate finger marks on the soft surface. Before heating any transparent plastic material, remove all of the masking paper and adhesive from the sheet. If the sheet is dusty or dirty, wash it with clean water and rinse it well. Dry the sheet thoroughly by blotting it with soft absorbent paper towels. For the best results when hot forming acrylics, adhere to the temperatures recommended by the manufacturer. Use a forced air oven that can operate over a temperature range of 120-374 degrees F, 49-190 degrees C. If the part gets too hot during the forming process, bubbles may form on the surface and impair the optical qualities of the sheet. For uniform heating, it is best to hang the sheets vertically by grasping them by their edges with spring clips and suspending the clips in a rack. Figure 7-90 if the piece is too small to hold with clips, or if there is not enough trim area, lay the Figure 7-90 Hanging an acrylic sheet 7-54 Sheets on shelves or racks covered with soft felt or flannel. Be sure there is enough open space to allow the air to circulate around the sheet and heat it evenly. Small forming jobs, such as landing light covers, may be heated in a kitchen baking oven. 
infrared heat lamps may be used, if they are arranged on 7 to 8 inch centers, and enough of them are used in a bank, to heat the sheet evenly. Place the lamps about 18 inches from the material. Never use hot water or steam directly on the plastic to heat it, because this likely causes the acrylic to become milky or cloudy. Forms. Heated acrylic plastic molds with almost no pressure, so the forms used can be of very simple construction. Forms made of pressed wood, plywood, or plaster are adequate to form simple curves, but reinforced plastic or plaster may be needed to shape complex or compound curves. Since hot plastic conforms to any waviness or unevenness, the form used must be completely smooth. To ensure this, sand the form and cover it with soft cloth, such as outing flannel or billiard felt. The mold should be large enough to extend beyond the trim line of the part, and provisions should be made for holding the hot plastic snug against the mold as it cools. A mold can be made for a complex part by using the damaged part itself. If the part is broken, tape the pieces together, wax or grease the inside, so the plaster does not stick to it, and support the entire part in sand. Fill the part with plaster and allow it to harden, and then remove it from the mold. Smooth out any roughness and cover it with soft cloth. It is now ready to use to form the new part. Forming methods. Simple curve forming. Heat the plastic material to the recommended temperature, remove it from the heat source, and carefully drape it over the prepared form. Carefully press the hot plastic to the form and either hold or clamp the sheet in place until it cools. This process may take from 10-30 minutes. Do not force cool it. Compound curve forming. Compound curve forming is normally used for canopies or complex wingtip light covers, and it requires a great deal of specialized equipment. There are four commonly used methods, each having its advantages and disadvantages. Stretch forming. Preheated acrylic sheets are stretched mechanically over the form in much the same way as is done with the simple curved piece. Take special care to preserve uniform thickness of the material, since some parts must stretch more than others. Male and female dye forming. Male and female dye forming requires expensive matching male and female dyes. The heated plastic sheet is placed between the dyes that are then mated. When the plastic cools, the dyes are opened. Vacuum forming without forms. Many aircraft canopies are formed by this method. In this process, a panel, which has cut into it the outline of the desired shape, is attached to the top of a vacuum box. The heated and softened sheet of plastic is then clamped on top of the panel. When the air in the box is evacuated, the outside air pressure forces the hot plastic through the opening and forms the concave canopy. It is the surface tension of the plastic that shapes the canopy. Vacuum forming with a female form. If the shape needed is other than that which would be formed by surface tension, a female mold or form must be used. It is placed below the plastic sheet and the vacuum pump is connected. When air from the form is evacuated, the outside air pressure forces the hot plastic sheet into the mold and fills it. Sawing and drilling. Sawing. Several types of saws can be used with transparent plastics. However, circular saws are the best for straight cuts. The blades should be hollow crowned or have some set to prevent binding. After the teeth are set, they should be side dressed to produce a smooth edge on the cut. Band saws are recommended for cutting flat acrylic sheets when the cuts must be curved or where the sheet is cut to a rough dimension to be trimmed later. Close control of size and shape may be obtained by band sawing a piece to within 1 16 inch of the desired size, as marked by a striped line on the plastic, and then sanding it to the correct size with a drum or belt sander. Drilling. Unlike soft metal, acrylic plastic is a very poor conductor of heat. Make provisions for removing the heat when drilling. Deep holes need cooling, and water-soluble cutting oil is a satisfactory coolant since it has no tendency to attack the plastic. The drill used on acrylics must be carefully ground, and free from nicks and burrs that would affect the surface finish. Grind the drill with a greater included angle than would be used for soft metal. The rate angle should be zero in order to scrape and not cut. The length of the cutting edge, and 7-55. Dubbed off to zero rate angle. Clip clearance angle. Included tip angle 140 degrees. Slow spiral polished flutes. Figure 7-91. Drill with an included angle of 140 degrees is used to drill acrylic plastics. Hence the width of the lip can be reduced by increasing the included angle of the drill. Figure 7-91. Whenever holes are drilled completely through acrylic, the standard twist drill should be modified to a 60 degrees tip angle, the cutting edge to a zero rate angle, and the back lip clearance angle increased to 12-15 degrees. Drills specially modified for drilling acrylic are available from authorized distributors and dealers. The patented on IBIT registered is good for drilling small holes in aircraft windshields and windows. Figure 7-92 it can cut holes from 1 8 to 1 half inch in 1 32 inch increments and produces good smooth holes with no stress cracks around their edges. Cementing. Polymerizable cements are those in which a catalyst is added to an already thick monomer polymer syrup to promote rapid hardening. Cement PS30 registered and weld on 40 registered are polymerizable cements of this type. They are suitable for cementing all types of plexiglas acrylic cast sheet and parts molded from plexiglas molding pellets. At room temperature, the cements harden, polymerize, in the container in about 45 minutes after mixing the components. 
they harden more rapidly at higher temperatures. The cement joints are usually hard enough for handling within 4 hours after assembly. The joints may be machined within 4 hours after assembly, but it is better to wait 24 hours. Figure 7-92 A bit register drill for drilling acrylic plastics. Application of cement. PS30 registered and weld on 40 registered joints retain excellent appearance and color stability after outdoor exposure. These cements produce clear, transparent joints and should be used when the color and appearance of the joints are important. PS30 registered and weld on 40 registered should be used at temperatures no lower than 65 degrees F. If cementing is done in a room cooler than 65 degrees F, it requires a longer time to harden, and the joint strength is reduced. The cement should be prepared with the correct proportions of components as given in the manufacturer's instructions and thoroughly mixed, making sure neither the mixing container nor mixing paddle adds color or affects the hardening of the cement. Clean glass or polyethylene mixing containers are preferred. Because of their short pod life, approximately 45 minutes, cement PS30 registered and weld on 40 registered must be used quickly once the components are mixed. Time consumed in preparation shortens the effective working time, making it necessary to have everything ready to be cemented before the cements are mixed. For better handling, pour cement within 20 minutes of mixing. For maximum joint strength, the final cement joint should be free of bubbles. It is usually sufficient to allow the mixed cement to stand for 10 minutes before cementing to allow bubbles to rise to the surface. The gap joint technique can only be used with colorless plexiglass acrylic, or in cases where joints are hidden. If inconspicuous joints and colored plexiglass acrylic are needed, the parts must be fitted closely, using closed V-groove, butt, or arc joints. Cement forms, or dams, may be made with masking tape, as long as the adhesive surface does not contact the cement. This is easily done with a strip of cellophane tape placed over the masking tape adhesive. The tape must be chosen carefully. The adhesive on ordinary cellophane tape prevents the cure of PS30 registered and weld on 40 registered. Before actual fabrication of parts, sample joints should be tried to ensure that the tape system used does not harm the cement. Since it is important for all of the cement to remain in the gap, only contact pressure should be used. Bubbles tend to float to the top of the cement bead in the gap joint after the cement is poured. These cause no problem if the bead is machined off. A small wire, not copper, or similar object may be used to lift some bubbles out of the joint. However, the cement joint should be disturbed as little as possible. Polymerizable cements shrink as the cement hardens. Therefore, the freshly poured cement bead should be left above the surfaces being cemented to compensate for the shrinkage. If it is necessary for appearances, the bead may be machined off after the cement has set. 7-56. Repairs. Whenever possible, replace, rather than repair, extensively damaged transparent plastic. A carefully patched part is not the equal of a new section, either optically or structurally. At the first sign of crack development, drill a small hole with a number 30 or a 1/8 inch drill at the extreme ends of the cracks. Figure 7-93 this serves to localize the cracks and to prevent further splitting by distributing the strain over a large area. If the cracks are small, stopping them with drilled holes usually suffices until replacement or more permanent repairs can be made. Cleaning. Plastics have many advantages over glass for aircraft use, but they lack the surface hardness of glass and care must be exercised while servicing the aircraft to avoid scratching or otherwise damaging the surface. Clean the plastic by washing it with plenty of water and mild soap, using a clean, soft, grit-free cloth, sponge, or bare hands. Do not use gasoline, alcohol, benzene, acetone, carbon tetrachloride, fire extinguisher or de-icing fluids, lacquer thinners, or window cleaning sprays. These soften the plastic and cause crazing. Plastics should not be rubbed with a dry cloth since it is likely to cause scratches and to build up an electrostatic charge that attracts dust particles to the surface. If, after removing dirt and grease, no great amount of scratching is visible, finish the plastic with a good grade of commercial wax. Apply the wax in a thin even coat and bring to a high polish by rubbing lightly with a soft cloth. Polishing. Do not attempt hand polishing or buffing until the surface is clean. A soft, open type cotton or flannel buffing wheel is suggested. Minor scratches may be removed by vigorously rubbing the affected area by hand, using a soft clean cloth dampened with a mixture of turpentine and chalk, or by applying automobile cleanser with a damp cloth. Remove the cleaner and polish with a soft dry cloth. Acrylic and cellulose acetate plastics are thermoplastic. Friction created by buffing or polishing too long in one spot can generate sufficient heat to soften the surface. This condition produces visual distortion and should be avoided. Wind shield installation. Use material equivalent to that originally used by the manufacturer of the aircraft for replacement panels. There are many types of transparent plastics on the market. Their properties vary greatly, particularly expansion characteristics, brittleness under low temperatures, resistance to discoloration when exposed to sunlight, surface checking, etc. Information on these properties is in mil HDBK17, plastics for flight vehicles, R2 transparent glazing materials, available from the government printing office, GPO. 
These properties are considered by aircraft manufacturers in selecting materials to be used in their designs, and the use of substitutes having different characteristics may result in subsequent difficulties. Installation procedures. When installing a replacement panel, use the same mounting method employed by the manufacturer of the aircraft. While the actual installation varies from one type of aircraft to another, consider the following major principles when installing any replacement panel. 1. Never force a plastic panel out of shape to make it fit a frame. If a replacement panel does not fit easily into the mounting, obtain a new replacement or heat the whole panel and reform. When possible, cut and fit a new panel at ordinary room temperature. 2. When clamping or bolting plastic panels into their mountings, do not place the plastic under excessive compressive stress. It is easy to develop more than 1000 psi on the plastic by over torquing the nut and bolt. Tighten each nut to a firm fit, and then back the nut off one full turn until they are snug and can still be rotated with the fingers. A. A1. All the strains that originally caused the crack are concentrated at point A tending to extend the crack. Therefore, with a number 30 or 1 slash 8 drill bit, drill a small hole at the end of the crack point to distribute the strain over a wider area. A1. Each crack occurring at any hole or tier is drilled in the same manner. Figure 7-93. Stop drilling of cracks. 7-57. 3. In bolted installations, use spacers, collars, shoulders, or stop nuts to prevent tightening the bolt excessively. Whenever such devices are used by the aircraft manufacturer, retain them in the replacement installation. It is important that the original number of bolts, complete with washers, spacers, et, be used. When rivets are used, provide adequate spacers or other satisfactory means to prevent excessive tightening of the frame to the plastic. 4. Mount plastic panels between rubber, cork, or other gasket material to make the installation waterproof, to reduce vibration, and to help to distribute compressive stresses on the plastic. 5. Plastics expand and contract considerably more than the metal channels in which they are mounted. Mount windshield panels to a sufficient depth in the channel to prevent it from falling out when the panel contracts at low temperatures or deforms under load. When the manufacturer's original design permits, mount panels to a minimum depth of 1-1-8 inches, and with a clearance of 1-8 inch between the plastic and bottom of the channel. 6. In installations involving bolts or rivets, make the holes through the plastic oversized by 1-8 inch in center, so that the plastic does not bind or crack at the edge of the holes. The use of slotted holes is also recommended. 7-58. Chapter 8. Aircraft Painting and Finishing.